My colleague Nathan Jones and I recently had the opportunity to interview two Bible prophecy experts named Andy Woods and Vic Batista. Dr. Woods is the pastor of a church in the Houston, Texas area. Mr. Batista is also the pastor of a church in the Miami, Florida area. Both are specialists in the field of Bible prophecy. I talked with Pastor Woods about the trends toward a world government, and Nathan talked with Pastor Batista about why pastors should include Bible prophecy in their teaching and preaching. Stay tuned for these interviews. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. Last week, I treated you to two interviews with uh, Bible prophecy experts. This week, I'm going to share with you two more similar interviews. The first is with Dr. Andy Woods, who is the pastor of Sugarland Bible Church in the Houston, Texas area. Andy has a fascinating educational background. He majored in business administration and political science at the University of the Redlands in California. He then earned a law degree at Whittier Law School in California. After practicing law for a while and teaching at a California community college, he decided to pursue a degree in theology. He attended Schaefer and Talbot seminaries and then earned a Doctor of Philosophy degree in Biblical Exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary. Today he serves as a professor at the College of Biblical Studies in Houston and pastors the Sugarland Bible Church. I talked with Andy about Bible prophecies concerning the establishment of a world government in the end times, and he shared with me some of the trends taking place today toward the fulfillment of those prophecies. Here now is that interview. Andy, uh, I often hear Bible prophecy teachers talk about the fact that the uh, Bible is going to uh, the Bible prophesies that there's going to be a world government in the end times. Is that true? Does the Bible really prophesy that? And if so, do you see any trends in that direction today? Yeah, I certainly do believe the Bible predicts this. <clears throat> uh, just a couple of scriptures that come to mind would be an Old Testament passage, Daniel 7 and verse 23. It's talking about the final form of Gentile domination that will exist on planet Earth before the return of Jesus at the end of the tribulation period. And it very clearly talks about the fourth beast and it says it will subdue the whole Earth. I mean the language there is very clear. So that's a very clear text talking about globalism. And then when we go into the New Testament we look at the book of Revelation. <clears throat> we have passages like Revelation 13 verse 7. Uh, Revelation 13 verse 8 which clearly describe a global sphere of the beast's rule. And another passage that comes to mind is the woman uh, sitting upon many harlot, uh, the harlot rather, sitting upon many waters in Revelation 17. I understand the woman is the antichrist system of the last days and the waters is all of the people that are influenced by that system. and. The, the waters is described as all of humanity. So, you know, quite clearly you have these predictions, Old and New Testament. And then to the second part of the question, are there any trends that are setting the stage for uh, this one world system? Well, the question is where to, where to begin. I mean, there's so many things to talk about. One of the things that's really on my heart, particularly since I have an eight-year-old at home, is the trend in education away from uh, American history, uh, American civilization, away towards sort of preparing people to be an American citizen. And now the emphasis seems to be more on preparing the global citizen of tomorrow. Multiculturalism. Absolutely, multiculturalism and this idea that all cultures are essentially equal. And um, you can actually graduate <clears throat> from public schools today and you can know far more about other cultures than you can know about our own culture. You know, it reminds me of the time, I, first time I went to India 
I never saw such poverty in all my life. So many suffering people, and all of it has to do with spiritual concepts. And, and, and you can't eat an animal because that may be your aunt who's reincarnated or whatever. Uh, and, and it just broke my heart. I got on the airplane to fly back home, and there was a movie they put on where Goldie Hawn is talking about her trip to India and how much it meant to her. And she said, oh, I, 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 I made an offering to the elephant god, and I just think these people are so wonderful that they worship nature. And, and I thought, what is going on here? There must be a disconnect. I mean, their whole culture has them in abject poverty. How can it, this concept that all cultures are just equal is just nonsense. Mm -hmm, yeah. I mean, that's exactly right. And when Goldie Hawn travels to these different parts of the world, I can guarantee you this much, she's not shown what you're talking about. She's put, put in the, you know, the very nice oh, hotel yes. and all of those kinds of things. Well, what's, what would be another trend toward the world government? Um, another trend that I see is the, what I would call the elite thinkers. And basically what I mean by elites are people that have influence in economics, politics, and religion. And, you know, we look at how they, how they talk and the kinds of choices that they make and we kind of scratch our heads and we say that doesn't make any sense. Well, the reason is they don't think like your typical average person. They do not look in terms of nation, the nation state or nations. They look in terms of the global system that's coming. In fact, they despise the nation state system, don't they? they? To a very large extent, they despise it. There's many quotes indicating that the, in their minds that the nation state is a form of idolatry. And that's troubling also as Bible readers because we believe that God himself at Babel, or Babel, Genesis 11 verses 1 through 9, intentionally created the nation state. And if you think about that for a minute, uh, that makes a lot of sense in a fallen world because if evil gets control of only one government, the potential for evil is, un, you know, there's nothing that can stop it. But if there are multiple nation states scattered throughout the earth, then evil can only get so far. Let's say evil gets hold of one nation, the other nations can oppose the evil taking place in that singular nation. I kind of look at nations as a check and balance system. I sort of believe that's the genius, one of the geniuses of the American system is there's this delicate separation of powers where not one group or personality can get control of everything. And so our founders were wise enough to not allow that to happen. Because they believed what the Bible taught about the nature of man. They sure did. It was Lord Acton, you know, that said power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely, and where where would we get these ideas from? We get them from the scripture. You know, we have passages like Jeremiah 17 and verse 9 that says the human heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Well, with Who regard to the nation state, it? isn't there a movement today toward regionalism? Absolutely, and that's one of the great attacks that's going on on the nation state. And real quickly, regionalism is this idea that you take a bunch of nation states that are perhaps in the same geographical area and you put sort of a supranational or transnational umbrella over them and therefore the real power is not any longer in these individual nation states, those are just debating societies, but it's some kind of city or overarching control over a particular region. I would argue that that's what's been going on in Europe for the last several decades. We could point to other parts of the world as well. And let's just say that we have in the end times 10 of these regions set up throughout the world. What will the Antichrist do? Well, he'll combine all of those regions under one global umbrella. And so I kind of look at regionalism, as you've brought up, as kind of a stepping stone, if you will, into world government. Are there any trends in the economic area that uh, point toward a world government? I think there's some very clear trends in the economic uh, uh, realm. One of them is the total trashing of the dollar. You know, the dollar has been looked at as almost the gold standard for so many years. And if you want to bring humanity away from, you know, looking up to a single currency and bring us more into a global currency, you have to bring down the value of the dollar. And it's a very frustrating thing watching our politicians because it seems like no matter who gets in there, they just run the printing presses as if there's no tomorrow. I believe that our national debt here in America is approaching the 
$18 trillion mark. It's a number so high, how could you pay back that money? And we look at this and we scratch our heads and saying, what is wrong with these people? But if your goal is a globalist paradigm and bringing in a single currency, then trashing the dollar through the running up of these national debts starts to make sense. So they, they look at things from a different paradigm than we do. Uh, you know, it, it seems to me that as I look around the world today, particularly in recent years, that, that leaders love crisis. Uh, the, the, it's, it's like, boy, I, I, I want a crisis. If I don't have one, maybe I can manufacture one because in crisis times, people are willing to give up freedom. They're willing to surrender to the government. Just give us some calm and peace, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's such a key point. Um, I would call this management by crisis. Um, you notice that some of the biggest uh, expansions of government that we've ever had in this country. Absolutely. Like, for example, what we've seen recently. And in the Great Depression. Great Depression and the takeover of the healthcare industry that just happened and things of that nature. It's always preceded by prolonged propaganda of crisis, crisis, crisis. The, healthcare system is falling apart and look at all of these uninsured people and so once that uh, crisis mentality is adopted by folks then they'll say well I will accept voluntarily uh, the government to come in and resolve the crisis for us. I personally believe that that's the big push in what they're calling climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, they're trying to convince us that the climate is in a state of crisis the climate changes all the time. I mean, <laughs> sure, and these weather reporters can't even get next week's or tomorrow's <laughs> no. weather report accurate. But the interesting thing is everything we do as human beings relates to the environment. So the hairspray we use, the food we eat, uh, where we work. And so if they can convince us that the climate is in a state of crisis, then we will accept pervasive government controls over virtually every area of life. One of the trends I see here in the United States of America that bothers me is one that particularly bothers me because I used to teach constitutional law. And that is the way in which we're marginalizing our Constitution, even to the point that the Supreme Court will actually say in decisions, we're basing this decision upon European uh, law, what, what they're doing in Europe rather than upon the Constitution of the United States. Yeah, isn't that an astounding thing? Uh, I, I was reading an attorney recently and he said the most frustrating thing about constitutional law and my study of it is we never actually studied the Constitution. We spent all of our time studying what judges said about the Constitution because most legal scholars unfortunately believe the Constitution is a what they call a living document. Well, if it's a living document, then we don't have a constitution. It's a meaningless document. And so they see the constitution as something that the judge gives meaning to. And so, therefore, if that's your paradigm, you spend all of your time studying judicial opinions and not the actual text. And as you indicated, one of the tragic things that's happening in the legal environment is this movement towards no longer basing rulings on the actual text of the constitution, but based on an analysis of global opinion. Well, it, it just seems to me that there are so many, many trends that are pointing in this direction, and you've done a great job of summarizing some of them. I think you, there's others that you have mentioned in other presentations, but these, these are really good, and uh, it just looks like the first time Jesus came, everything was prepared for his coming in terms of language, in terms of Israel being the, the crossroads of the world and having a common language like Greek and all. And now it looks like everything is being prepared for the second coming. Right. I'm reminded of Galatians 4.4. 4. It says, when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son. You know, Jesus didn't just come into the world at any time. The stage was set, as you just pointed out. And if we can accept that related to the first advent of Christ, why would it not also be equally true with the second advent of Christ? And some of the verses that we've had a, just a few moments to go over indicate some very clear governmental uh, trends that will exist in the last days. And so why can't we understand the stage being set for those trends for the second coming, just like they were set for the first coming? Well, folks, as you can see, I've been joined by my colleague, Nathan Jones, who serves as our web minister. For those of you who may have tuned in late, we are presenting two interviews we conducted recently with Bible prophecy experts. The interview you've just been watching was with Dr. Andy Woods, the pastor of Sugarland Bible Church in the Houston, Texas area. 
The next interview we would like to share with you is one that Nathan conducted with his friend Vic Batista. Nathan, tell us about Vic. Well, Pastor Vic is the pastor of Calvary Chapel Aventura, and that's in the Miami, Florida area. He is a bilingual pastor. He preaches both in English and in Spanish in an area that is predominantly uh, Jewish, which is interesting. Yes. He also is a host of a T-Wave.TV radio program called The Truth Will Set You Free. And you can catch our program, which I'm the frequent guest on, every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And as I understand it, he's originally from the Dominican Republic. He is a Dominican. Yes, he is. So he's got many talents. Now here now is my discussion with Vic. Pastor Vic, it is great to have you on. Usually you are interviewing me and I think it's awesome that I get to interview you. You're a pastor of a church in Miami. You have your own radio program. Yes. But I noticed that what you concentrate on so much is Bible prophecy. Matter of fact, you and I met at a pre-trib conference uh, wow, five years ago. Yeah. And that's where I knew you have a passion for Bible prophecy and I have a bi passion for Bible prophecy. But I find that many pastors don't. Right. Why, how do you do that? How do you have a passion for Bible prophecy yet it spills over into the way you pastor? And we'll flesh that out a little. Nathan, that's a very good question. First, thank you for giving me this opportunity to be here with you. And one of the things is that I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And as I was looking back when the baptism of the Holy Spirit occurred in my life, it gave me a burden and a passion for the things of the Lord, and then also for Bible prophecy. And uh, also being part of Calvary Chapel and making my way through the whole Bible, through uh, Pastor Chuck Smith's teachings on Bible prophecy, it really solidified for me the need to be able to learn myself also Bible prophecy. So what I've done throughout our ministry is simply make it a point as I'm learning to be teaching others and teaching our congregation. So it's been a really, really enjoyable time uh, reading the Word of God and just allowing the Holy Spirit uh, to teach me what He wants from His Word. Now you pastor both in English and in Spanish, and it's beautiful to hear you switch between the two of them. Uh, give us a pulse of the Hispanic community. When it comes to Bible prophecy, a lot of us don't get to make inroads in the Hispanic community. Yes. What are their feelings about God's prophetic word? 31% of the Bible being Bible prophecy. Tell us a little of that. Bueno, Nathan, muchas gracias. No, I'm just kidding. I said, Nathan, thank you so much. <laughs> no, <laughs> Actually, really? okay. I'm originally from the Dominican Republic. Okay. And uh, I, I do uh, two services, one in Spanish and one in English. But then I came to realize for the Spanish community, there really wasn't much out there in terms of Bible prophecy, at least sound teaching of Bible prophecy in the pre-trib uh, type of uh, teachings. And I felt the Lord also put it in my heart to be able to reach to the Spanish community that I'm originally from and make sure that they also understand Bible prophecy and all the events that the Bible talks about. But it was just a lack there, Nathan, and being that I can speak both languages, I figure, well, let me uh, fill in the gap here and be able to bring the, the Bible prophecy uh, teachings to both English and Spanish community. Now, what do you think then is the major hurdles that pastors have to go through to teach Bible prophecy. We find increasingly, and this is a, a passion for us here at Lamb and Lion Ministries, is that a lot of churches are abandoning the teaching of God's prophetic word. Yes. But you, in your church, and in the, pretty much in the Calvary Chapel Network, feel a great passion for Bible prophecy. Why is that? Absolutely. Well, Nathan, again, I, I, it goes back to the leading of the Holy Spirit in my life and seeing a void and also seeing all these false doctrine entering into the churches. And then as I met and talked to many other pastors, uh, some of them were afraid of Bible prophecy uh, as if- Why so? As if they couldn't understand or if it was okay. too difficult. And I believe many of them uh, are missing the blessing that we find in the Word of God. And in Revelation chapter one, this is one of the verses that really spoke to me and motivated me to continue uh, to teach Bible prophecy because it says in Revelation 1, 3, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. Uh, there's a blessing there. And I, I wanted that blessing, Nathan, and I felt others need uh, to understand that. So those pastors that don't teach, I believe they're fearful. They think that they can't understand it. They think that it's too difficult. And that's why when I teach Bible prophecy, I try to bring it in a, in a ABC type of format. Very easy to understand. So others can say, if that Dominican can do it, I can do it. <laughs> Well, you're not just trying to equip then church people, you're trying to equip pastors then to be able to teach God's prophetic word as well. Yes, Nathan, pastors as well. We started about six months ago uh, a program called the Calvary Chapel Bible Prophecy School of Ministry Radio Edition, and it's primarily to reach Calvary Chapel pastors to get back into teaching Bible prophecy. And by being able to uh, myself be able to call them and talk to them and encourage them, 
Uh, that's one way that I find I can reach some pastors in our movement to be able to teach Bible prophecy. And when you teach them, what do you teach in the way of, you know, how, how do they best reach people to Bible prophecy? I mean, do they you hit them hard with the tribulation? Uh, do you start talking about Antichrist? Or is there a specific burden on your heart when it comes to Bible prophecy that you use to reach people? I believe evangelism. That's why I also love your ministry, Lamb and Lion, Dr. Reagan here, because it's evangelistic. At the end of the day, we don't want to forget that person that is listening or viewing on the other side. They need Jesus, and therefore in Bible prophecy, we believe it's very important to include evangelism. So that's always been the style in which I bring it forth. We touch on different topics of the Word of God. We go through different books of the Bible. Sometimes I'll highlight a special book, maybe within uh, the Calvary Chapel movement, uh, Cap, uh, Pastor Chuck's new book. Uh, uh, we, we use those as resources, something familiar for other pastors to identify with. So that's one of the ways we do it, Nathan, and more evangelistically. And I notice you go verse by verse, right, and then pull the, the teachings out. You let the Bible teach Bible prophecy rather than going through a set plan. Absolutely, and I think that's fun. You and I have done a number of programs, and we took Ezekiel 38 and 39, and we just gone verse by verse and chapter by chapter, and it's been really exciting to do it in that way. Also, the book of Revelation, just uh, in about two weeks, I'm going to start doing another a book of Revelation review and basically bring it chapter by chapter and verse by verse, and hopefully whoever is, uh, it will be part of it will be able to have an easy understanding. Fantastic. Now, when you talk about easy understanding, I'm always impressed with the, your methods of outreach. Because not only do you, do you have a church and, and you have conferences and speakers and you, you minister to pastors, but you have your own radio program. And you, you use, uh, man, tweet casts and things <laughs> I'd never heard of. And you are very passionate, like me, about using technology to reach people for Christ. Tell me, what are some of the ways that we reach people where they are at? Nathan, today we see there's a new culture arising younger people, more techy individuals, and I come from a background of technology. I graduated at Wright University, worked for some of the big companies in technology, and I felt this is a great opportunity to reach different groups. And now with the technology ever changing, I figure what a better way than grabbing hold of this technology and being able to reach as many people as possible, much like you do, that you reach billions of people uh, through your web ministry. So we believe uh, using the latest technology, uh, for me it comes very easy. So it doesn't really distract me from my, my uh, teaching of the Word of God and my study. As a matter of fact, I include it there. And then this way, it all becomes part of teaching God's Word and reaching young people, reaching older people, men, women, and children. And, and you and I, we also have a passion for reaching the young people yes. with Bible prophecy. So my, my children, my daughter, one is 19, my other daughter is 18, my son is 15, and they already know Bible prophecy and are beginning to defend uh, the faith. My children, exactly. They, they love Bible prophecy. I remember back in Bible college and seminary, a love for Bible prophecy. Other students, a love for Bible prophecy. But then somewhere after college, it gets squelched. Uh, I know a lot of pastors, you guys are on the front lines. You have to deal with you know, divorces and addictions and, and things like that. But you never give up the message of Bible prophecy. Why? Why is it so important that you teach it? How does that help people with addictions and people going sure. through problems and all? Well, Nathan, I feel that I need to teach it because as I look in the Bible, as I look at the Word of God in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, there's a, a, a portion there of Scripture in verses 4 and on. And Paul writing, he says, But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We're not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and of love and as a helmet of hope of salvation. And I believe, Nathan, for me, I need to make sure that I'm also uh, uh, learning the scriptures and growing in the things of the Lord and especially in Bible prophecy. So for me, this scripture speaks volumes as to why I need to be growing and also studying and teaching others Bible prophecy. Now for those pastors out there who are, like you said, they're scared of teaching God's prophetic word. 31% of the Bible we're talking about here. What advice would you have for them? I will say, Nathan, you know, don't be afraid and I'll speak also into the cameras. I said, don't be afraid, but also trust the Lord. Uh, he's going to lead you, He's going to guide you, and it's a wonderful thing that you can do for your congregation uh, when they teach Bible prophecy, Nathan, because our congregation, it, they become alive, and their eyes begin to open, and they're, and, wow, I didn't know that, and it encourages them. And Bible prophecy is one of those things that pastors and leaders, when you yourself study it, and when you teach your congregation, they're going to be excited, and it's going to be awesome, Nathan. 
It is. It's an exciting topic. I love to see my kids' eyes light up when they learn something new and when they get hope for the future. And brother, that's what excites me about you is that you don't get into the mired details of, of how depressing the world is getting and, and all. I mean, you dress that, definitely. But you bring, when you speak, a hope for the future. Tell us, what is the hope for the future that Bible prophecy well, gives us? Well, it's Jesus, Nathan, and we know he's coming soon. And that's why we always want to encourage those that are tuned in or watching or listening to our programs, the one that you and I do together every week. We always end at the end with a message that the Lord is coming, but you need to be prepared. You need to make sure that you have a personal relationship with him, that he loves you, that he died, rose again. And if you confess your sins and trust in him, he will give you eternal life. And that is the good news, Nathan. <laughs> that is the good news. Bible prophecy is the message of good news. It's good it? news. And it's not all gloom and doom. That's why some individuals, they get the wrong impression. And I believe some of that has to do with some of the teachers that are out there, Nathan, that they have, in a sense, given a black eye to Bible prophecy, uh, always the gloom and doom. But we find that it's hope and just a wonderful, wonderful privilege to be able to share that with others. I get excited, and especially on your radio program, which we do weekly, and I appreciate you having me on each week, is that when we get into the millennial kingdom, when we talk about Jesus Christ returning and it gives us hope that we know that Jesus Christ is coming back. He's coming to rule and reign and we'll live in a world of peace, righteousness and justice. And you bring that enthusiasm to people. And I pray that all pastors out there grab hold of that enthusiasm and get that out there. In, in the 20 seconds we have left, yes. can you tell somebody how they can know Jesus as their Savior? Very simple. The Bible tells us that we confess the Lord, believe in our heart, repent from our sins. And you can, right where you are, just close your eyes and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me for my sins. Lord, I believe in you. I want to invite you to come into my heart and be my Lord and be my Savior. And someone prays a simple friend, they mean it from their heart, Nathan, and the Bible says they can be saved. Amen. Thank you, Vic. Well, folks, that's our program for this week, and I hope it's been a blessing to you. And I hope you'll be back with us next week when we present an in-depth interview with Tim LaHaye. Until then, the Lord willing, this is Dave Reagan speaking for Lamb and Lion Ministries saying, Look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. Dr. David Reagan's book, God's Plan for the Ages, contains a comprehensive overview of all aspects of Bible prophecy. It's written in an easy-to-understand, down-to-earth style that you will find appealing. In addition to all the prophecies concerning the first and second comings of the Messiah, it deals with a host of other prophetic questions such as, what happens when you die? What will heaven be like? What's the future of the earth? Where is the United States in prophecy? When is the rapture most likely to occur? Is the Antichrist alive today? Are there signs of the times that are unique to our day and age? The book contains a variety of charts and diagrams which illustrate various aspects of Bible prophecy. The book is available for a gift of $20 or more, including the cost of shipping. Please call the number you see on the screen Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Central Time, and ask for it by name, or order online at lamblion.com. The book contains 42 exciting chapters about Bible prophecy and runs a total of 415 pages. Again, it can be yours for a gift of $20 or more, including shipping. And for a limited time, we will include a copy of Dr. Reagan's Prophetic Manifesto. Just ask for offer number 702. Call the number you see on the screen or go to our website at lamblion.com. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus. 